Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Minister has said most of what I want to say. But still, since I'm the chair, bear with me, I'll have to reiterate it a little more. As he said, terror and violence are now the major determinants in national and international politics. So hence, it is more than predictable that several countries are using these kind of tools, instrumentalizing these kind of tools to further their own political and economic initiatives. As he said, this is absolutely visible in, in our uh, neighboring, favorite neighboring country, Pakistan, where under, uh, under the need for what they call, a highly questionable need for what they call strategic depth, the terror is unleashed in Afghanistan, and again, for various political reasons, in Kashmir. Well, the Pakistan model has been seen throughout, and as, uh, as was heard in the uh, Honorable Minister's speech and in the discussions that followed, yes, uh, a lot of what is happening in the Middle East can hardly be, ha can hardly be wholly attributed to a, a fight between, uh, you know, the Imams in, uh, uh, in the Middle Ages and the Shia and Sunni divide has got very many more in under economic underpinnings. The, the great game is continuing to be played. Uh, superpower rivalries are continuing and most of these most of, these, uh, most of these divisions are using various forms of terror, various forms of extremism to further their ends. Consequent, consequently, ladies and gentlemen, the world has now become a quantifiably more dangerous place. Radicalism and extremism, extreme recidivism, is perhaps higher today than it was even some, even say during the time of the Second World War. Polarization is very much more evident. Now, what has happened, and this is one point that I would uh, like to make, while we can say that um, <clears throat> terror has got various political and uh, economic underpinnings, the consequences of terror is something that we need to discuss. When we see that countries, and we can see it, I mean, I'm just using this as an example, but the same thing can be replicated around the world. When we see what has happened in Pakistan, now in order to use terror as, a, as, a, as an initiative, you will need to radicalize the population. Extremism cannot go without concurrent radicalization. Now with concurrent radicalization, the country is unleashing several eddy, eddy currents which actually radicalize the population. Now, this is something that we have seen not just in Pakistan. We have seen it happening in Afghanistan. We have seen it in places in Russia. We have seen it uh, across, across the world, definitely in the Middle East. Today, it's like what is said in, um, what is said in uh, Julius Caesar, you know, it's cry havoc and let loose the dogs of war. The dogs of war here being the call, the forces of radicalization, and it is, it is there, they're there, there, and it is now going, becoming increasingly difficult to control them, more so with, this, with the expanse of internet connectivity that is there. So as I, I reiterate, today we are perhaps in a more dangerous place than we have been since the Second World War. It's a sobering thought, and this puts a lot of onus and a lot of responsibility on any kind of counter-terrorism initiatives, which makes the counter-terrorism initiatives more urgent and more difficult. Given that, I am glad that we have today with us a panel of practitioners and academicians. We're glad that they are here to give us their inputs because we as Indians, we have a pluralistic society. We are living in a very difficult neighborhood. And this, this issue of the politics of terror is a matter of great significance and importance for us.